Welcome to the Erasing Shame podcast, season one. This podcast is about erasing shame through honest talk for healthy living, emotionally, relationally, mentally, and personally. Visit our website at erasingshame.com for links to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Now, let's have an honest talk for healthy living. Well, welcome to the Erasing Shame podcast, the place for honest talk for healthy living. And today we are joined with Fanny Tam, and she is a pastor's wife and a counselor. So we are going to learn about uh, shame in a uh, particular context uh, that is uh, Chinese and American both at the same time and how that affects um, people and how we can live healthy in that kind of a mix. Uh, Let me introduce Fanny uh, real quickly. As a young person, Fanny responded to God's call to leave Hong Kong and pursue her training of integrative study in counseling and biblical study. She obtained her graduate study from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and University of Louisville in Kentucky. She currently is, has a renewed and continued passion of, uh, working over 20 years at Grace Christian Counseling, a private practice both in Rhode Island and Toronto as a licensed and registered clinician doing individual marital family and group psychotherapy. She co-labors with her husband, Reverend Timothy Tam in South American and Canadian Chinese churches in Boston, Rhode Island and Toronto loves being a stay-at-home mom parents three children presently the daughter her daughter and son-in-law are missionaries in the philippines and her oldest son is in business and her youngest son is in christian ministry um we're gonna um oh hobbies let's jump uh, real quickly hobbies traveling (gasps) uh, workout hiking reading and crafts so maybe one day we'll meet in person fanny thank you for joining us on this podcast Okay, my, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Well, take take a minute or two and share about your experience in working with uh, different people in the Chinese and American context. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I lived uh, 17 years in Rhode Island. And when I worked there, I worked about 15 years as a psychotherapist in the professional field and also set up my own Christian counseling. So I noticed that like uh, I work with a lot of Caucasian clients, 99% of my clients back then in Rhode Island were Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And then when they come in, it doesn't seem like they fight against this sense of shame and guilt, Mm. right? They were ready to see a doctor and disclosing themselves. So Americans are very good in talking about their own anxiety attack or depression, you know. Mm -hmm. They would not share that with friends. But then when they are ready to come in, they will talk about how they suffer though. Mm -hmm. When I came back to Toronto, I worked with a more multicultural group, you know. So I have clients that are from the Caribbean, from Asia, and some are Chinese, some are white, you know. So I noticed that the Canadians are a little bit more laid back, you know, and then they, it takes them longer to get help, you know. It seemed like that, you know, with the Asian collective culture is different from individualized culture. So people do struggle more with shame and guilt. But with Can you the say American, a little bit more about that? What's the difference between an individual culture and a collective culture? Well, individualized culture, they believe they have their own rights, you know, mm. and then they have a sense of entitlement that they need help. If they suffer, they are going to get medication to fix their problems and psychotherapy. But the collective culture is like whatever they do, they have to think within a context. Hmm. So they are afraid if their friends or their family know about this, it's going to reflect on them too, you know? Uh 
So that's the difference that I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you have many years of experience, more than I initially thought. So what uh, would you say are the three most common issues that people come to you for help? Well, people, you know, most guys, they will not get help until they hit a wall. And women mm. are more receptive to get help, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would say when they are living in fear, you know, so if they have, uh, they are afraid of certain things, saying agoraphobia or, you know, uh, anxiety attack, mm. or they thought they have a heart attack and the ambulance sent them to the hospital, but in fact, they suffer anxiety attack, you know, there's mm. no heart condition that they have to be admitted into the hospital. So that's number one. Number two is people are so sad they can barely function. So people can suffer from depression mm. and it's hard for them to function properly on a day to day basis, even going to work or taking a shower. So so that could be, you know, they struggle with the sadness and depression. And then thirdly, I would say that, you know, people suffer from broken relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. so they could come in and complain about their family, their friends, or their parents, or their children, you know. So I noticed that they could be traumatized, you know. They could be abused as a child mm -hmm. and they could mm -hmm. suffer sexual abuse. So I would say fear, mm -hmm. sadness, and brokenness. So I classify mm -hmm. them under three professional terms. Fear is anxiety. So sadness is depression, anger turns inward. And brokenness is from their wounded past, their trauma. Mm. Wow. Well, so now, a lot of people have not gone to counseling before, and there are many reasons they don't go because of the shame and the stigma. So can you describe for those first timers what it's like to see a counselor? Well, uh, it could be a scary thing. So usually when they come in, you know, I'll have them fill up an intake form and go through the form with them. So I also explained to them that everything that we talk about would be kept strictly confidential. Mm -hmm. So it's a confidential relationship. So I go through the contract with them, you know, go through the face sheet. And then I would ask them, what would you like to happen as a result of coming here? And then uh, they would start talk about their expectations or why they, or who referred them, you know. And then I asked them to have a video description of what happened to them and how they suffered that prompted them to come and how long have they been in this situation. Then mm -hmm. I assess their general, you know, social situation, jobs or abuse and and usually I want to make it light too. And we could chit chat a little bit, you know, just to build up that allegiance, to make them feel comfortable, you know, that they are welcome mm -hmm. here. Good. And uh, if I have time, I'll do like a genogram. It's like assessing them with like a family tree about okay. the just names of the family members and and whether they do suffer other mental health issues as well. So basically, I listen to them a lot, you know, and ask mm -hmm. questions and uh, validate, you know, what they tell me. Very good. So in the first session, it may take um, several sessions for people to really open up and get to the root of the issue that they're really wrestling with. Yes. So when they initially come in, they, they might just be checking you out and see if they're yes. feel comfortable talking with you. For uh, and, and there are times then a uh, person might come in, I guess you call them clients, yeah. and they don't feel comfortable. Is, is that okay? 
Yeah, it's okay. I always say when a person come in to see me, I call them visitors in the first few sessions. Mm, that's Not good. fine yet. But after a couple of sessions, if they feel comfortable, they feel like I can help them out, you know, we'll set up a contract. It's an open contract treatment plan between me and them. And then they become my client, you know. So I agree, a lot of people are checking people out, you know. And uh, I, I, I remember I worked with a male client and he came to check out with me and the initial issue was like he got some marital problems with his wife. So I saw him for two sessions and he said that it was sexual. But then he quit seeing me afterwards. And two years down the road, he called me again and say that, Fanny, I feel comfortable with you because I was sexually molested by a man. I need a wow. woman to work with me. So he came back after two years and, and I started working with him. And ever since we were in a journey to help him to heal from his sexual molestation. So that wow. was, uh, you never know, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when people come to, your, uh, come to you for help, they might be saying something about their uh, past or their struggle or their problem for the very first time. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a huge uh, step of uh, courage and faith. How, yeah. how, how do you see people overcoming that step and stepping out of that darkness of shame? Yeah. Well, it takes a lot of uh, courage and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it, they have to hit a wall before they will get help. And there will be resistance, you know, I think for people to call. Uh, and I find out especially what happened in Toronto, if they're Asians, uh, they have to call a focus on the family and have a counselor praying with them on the phone, have a counselor speaking to them first uh, and then encourage them to come or a, a pastor, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, friend, a family member would work with that resistance for a while, you know. They may say, you know, well, I'm going to eat healthy food or do exercise and then my depression will be gone, you know. They may say, oh, well, uh, you go first, say the husband will reject the wife. You go first, you know, and see how that goes. You check it out. So I usually say the one that call, the family member that call, you come in first and then I will work with you. You know, although your husband or your child may not be willing to come, but if I work with you, changing one of the system in your family system, it will affect the other person as well. So sometimes, um, you know, the husband will gradually come when he's seeing the wife is making a difference. So the wife is trying, right? Or a child or a teenager may come too if they see their parents are gradually changing. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a whole nother dimension of uh, shame um, and relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that uh, oftentimes the issues that we wrestle with are related to other people. It's mm -hmm. not just an individual thing. Yeah. And it sounds like um, you're able to uh, work with just one to begin working with the entire uh, family or the group. Exactly. Very good. Now, of course, people would come to you for help when they hit a wall, or when they're desperate. But what can we do to help people before they get to that point of desperation, that this kind of a resource and this kind of thing is healthy for them? I see. I think um, we could educate them, you know, about mental issues. And, um, and a lot of the people don't know what that is. And mm. I'm sure with the Asian community, there's a lot of denial because you cannot when a person is sick, I mean, they got headache, but mentally, you know, you cannot see it. So, although you can feel it, that something is not quite right with that person. So there's a lot of denial among the Asian community. 
you know, in thinking that, oh, uh, depression doesn't exist, uh, PTSD does not exist, it's just having a bad mood, you know, and even, you know, uh, a lot of the cultures, even the Caribbean culture, you know, they deny that too, you know. Mm. So uh, I think in the community or in, within the collective community, we need a lot of education to to educate people and sometimes yeah. even i speak after i speak in a with a workshop in a church setting and then there will be people you know coming to see me mm. because they notice that they are not they are struggling mm. mm -hmm. uh, what other uh what formats of education have you found people most receptive to is it like a workshop or is it like um a half day conference or some kind of a panel discussion or something else? I see. It could be anything, even a workshop in a fellowship group, say, or even with a community center, you know, uh, or even at church, uh, even, you know, uh, in Bible study, I talk about some of these issues too. And uh, I remember after I went to a life group thing, a Bible study, so uh, a woman told me that, oh, I, I have a friend who's needing uh, this type of help. But after two months, she called me on the phone and said she's the one that needed the help, you know. Sometimes people are in denial or they feel ashamed of their own struggles. And at times uh, they could be ashamed because other people were offending them. They suffer from their abuse, you know, they were ashamed to talk about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, you work specifically in a Chinese North American context. Uh, you, when you were young, you came from Hong Kong. So are you yes. uh, fluent in um, many languages? Yes, I can speak Cantonese and Mandarin, you know. Very good. I notice that my most, the most, uh, my most effective way of uh, ministry counseling people i in fact english with the english speaking group because they are more open and then they're more receptive you know and because i've been trained to use english as my first language in mental health it's easy for me to explain to them mm -hmm. too so it's possible that the language um the terminology that english has is uh, not developed and absent from uh, maybe some of the Asian cultures. So how have you, what have you found helpful in mediating the different cultures and different generations? Uh, well, uh, I would use examples, you know, mm -hmm. so I have to use their te uh, terminology, you know. Say, for example, I was working with a Chinese client and then I was feeling that there was some resistance that this guy, I was trying to explain to him that he has to learn to own himself because he used to talk around the bush, beat around the bush, you know, when he's talking to his wife. So That's I said, a very Asian way of communicating. Yeah, it is. They do beat around the bush. And I said, it must be very difficult for her to understand, you know. And then she, he's defensive. So he's trying to say, you know, usually when is, I could be straightforward too with little things, but with politics or other things, I could speak like a, a third person, you know. Actually, it's hard for him to own himself and to express his own idea an opinion at times mm, that's a struggle mm -hmm. because as a child uh, he he lost one of his parents and then the mm. grandparent was raising him so there are things like that you know that bothers him and he gets depressed you know when he cannot speak up his own mind and he'll try to beat himself up you know that's part of shame and guilt too yeah, that's, that's been part of my own story as well. I came to the U.S. when I was eight. I was oh. born in Taiwan, but grew up in a traditional Chinese family, and I was, I was just not in touch with my feelings. Yes. And I was not in touch with my opinions. Uh -huh. So uh, I didn't discover language for that until well into my 30s. Uh -huh. 
Oh, okay. And now I'm 50. And so um, I can see where you're talking about that for yes. people in the traditional Asian culture. It's just not part of their lifestyle. Yeah. And if you look at the developmental stage of a person, you know, from two to five years old, a person gradually, this little kid gradually develop a sense of autonomy. But then without being able to de develop that sense of autonomy, you know, guilt and shame develop. So a lot of people are still stuck in that stage, you know, when at two to five years old, they were not allowed to be themselves and make some, you know, cho choices. Say mommy and daddy would say, you have to do this, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, the Asian, like the culture that you came from, this, uh, is kind of authoritative, right? Mm -hmm. So the parents have to decide for you. So you don't develop that sense of uh, autonomy so gradually, when people are not allowed to own themselves and develop a sense of their own autonomy, there's guilt and shame, you know. And like what you said, you know, till around 30 years old or even 40 or older, people still mm -hmm. cannot own themselves. And then they still struggle with shame and guilt, you know, every time they have to make a decision they have second thoughts of doubting themselves and thinking that they may not make the right decision, you know. Nobody is completely perfect though, you know. We all have to try out and own ourselves. Hmm. If, if they only had a counselor like you. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> it's very hard to do uh, be, be beyond uh, the uh -huh. supportive environment of a counseling session. For those yeah. that are willing to go there, I mean, uh -huh. uh, education can kind of introduce people to the potential mm -hmm. of this healthy living. But boy, I sure wish there was a bigger way to uh, invite people into a healthier way of living. Yeah, sure. And then when people learn through therapy, so that's part of the healing process. They learn to assert themselves, own themselves. And then they experience a sense of acceptance and love, you know. Then they gradually will develop that self, you know. Like a, a young child would develop. They have that confidence. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, a number of our listeners, as we've uh, done this podcast for several months now, would really love to learn how to deal with the intergenerational and multicultural challenges for healthy relationships and healthy parenting. Do you have some advice for that? Uh, in regarding parenting? Yes. So uh, for someone who's second generation, let's say, uh -huh. grew up in America, English speaking, and they're acculturated in a Western mindset. Yes. But at home with their parents, and then when they have children, uh, there might be a default tendency to parent the children the way they were parented. Oh, okay. And if they haven't had the uh, benefit of going through counseling to understand the family dynamic from the parents, yeah. they might pass on things that they don't want to pass along to their children. Yeah. yeah. So what, what advice do you have for uh, people in that context? I see. Well, if they were being injured by their parents because of neglect or abuse or, or there's a lack of bonding that they experience with their own biological parents or caregiver. So the parent themselves needs to be healed first and deal with the the negligence that they that they were imposed brought by their own parents. So, so otherwise we are gonna repeat the same situation to our next generation, right? So, yeah. I think it's um. So how could be like we read books or go for therapy? You know, if there are really brokenness that we them, ourselves cannot bond with our own biological parents. So we're missing the first round though. 
that's affecting our way of parenting our own kids. So we could be doing an extreme type of parenting. Uh, is if our parents are too strict with us, we could be too lenient with our next generation because we we suffer that we suffer as victims, you know. Or we're going to repeat that same situation scenario to our next generation. So we need to deal with our baggage and be healthy. But wouldn't you say that this is such a common situation for uh -huh. those who grow up in an Asian family that um, if someone were to get help for themselves to become healthy and deal with their brokenness, would that come across disrespectful to their parents? And would no, that make no. them the odd person out that they yeah. don't seem so Chinese anymore? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I explained to my clients. I'm saying, you know, when you tell me how you suffer and what happened to you, we are not trying to blame anyone. We're trying to acknowledge what happened to you as a person. So yeah. there's, there's no blaming. We're not you saying your parents are scapegoat of your anger. It's not. We're trying to figure out why you are like this, though, why you struggle with uh, guilt and shame, you know, what happened to you. So, mm -hmm. so I never ask my clients to go home and confront their parents, though, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in different, well, the, on the other hand, they have to acknowledge what happened to them is causing them pain, you know, and shame and guilt, you know. They have to understand why they behave like this, why they feel like this, you know. And then their parents could be doing the best that they can, but not know, knowing that they were harming their children too, you know. Mm. So uh, part of it is to gradually, when they learn to talk about what happened to them, in fact, they can really forgive their parents after a while, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not initially, but later on. Because oh, that's good. They, that's a hopeful approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very hopeful approach. Mm. There will be proper forgiveness down the road when they are healed. Okay, one, one last question then. So there's a, a book that became uh, kind of popular because okay. um, this, this mom wanted their children to do really well in school and yes. she became known as the tiger mom. Yes. And that I seemed to have some yeah. Asian <laughs> cultural background. So, uh -huh. uh, boy, how, how do you address that? Was, that? was that just a stereotype, a hyperbole? Or is there some truth to that, that um, perhaps we can gain a better perspective on how to raise healthy children? Well, I think uh, we need some boundaries for children, you know, without rules and boundaries. And uh, rules and boundaries come when we train up a kid. I said the first six years of a person's life is extremely important. If this young kid do not listen to any rules and regulations, then this person will not be able to respect their principal, their teacher, or their wives, you know. So uh, I would say that developmentally, it's important to mold a child in the first six years. But afterwards, you know, after 12 years old, you can no longer be a tiger mom, you know. You need to give them a certain level of freedom, of choices, though, you know. Mm. And so we have to do it according to their developmental stage. And then when there's a young adult there, the parents uh, needs to develop a friendship with their teenage, you know, young adult kids uh, so that there's proper respect. And then the kid will end up, you know, eventually taking care of this parent because um, of you know, that he's getting a lot from their parents. He's going to do the same and give out a lot more when the parents grow old too. So I would say, you know, uh, there's no set of ways to parent your kids. Uh, we have to do it according to the developmental stage and then the biological stage of a, a, a child. 
Well, uh, those are very new ideas, and I hope as uh, people are introduced to them here on this uh, podcast, uh, they would be open to learn some more about mm -hmm. a uh, better and healthier way to parent and also um, going forward in health for themselves. Is there a book you, can, you would recommend, and how can people get in touch with you? I see. Well, I really like this book. Um, it's an old book. It's by Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, and he, that's his first book that he wrote. And it's called Changes That Heal. Mm. So it talks about explain why we, are, why we feel a certain way, why we behave a certain way. And although it's a Christian book, but it's quite universal for everyone too. So I do highly recommend that book. And for Asians that suffer with guilt and shame, so because uh, a lot of times we do not want to speak up for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, another book that I gave that to you is called uh, Christian Assertiveness, you know. It's written in a Christian context. I think it would be helpful for, for we to know that as Jesus is asserting himself, so we have the right to uh, assert ourselves too, and not being too aggressive or too passive. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Fanny, for joining us on Erasing Shame. Uh, you've been very helpful, and I hope that um, our listeners will be very encouraged to uh, work on their health along with their um, maybe first generation immigrant parents as well. Uh, sure. Having, having understanding is such an uh, important step to go forward together. Sure. It's my pleasure talking well, Let me give you. a closing word to our listeners. Thank you for uh, watching or listening to Erasing Shame podcast. You can connect with us at erasingshame.com. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and subscribe to us on iTunes or whatever podcatcher you would like. We would love to hear from you. You can email us confidentially on our contact page. And until next time, um, we'll stay connected online. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, thank you.